it's a war zone. Hey, you know, I'm totally alone in enemy territory. What are they gonna do to me? Are they gonna torture me now? I had to figure out ways to escape. It was all up to me. I had to be strong. But I was telling myself, there's no way I'm gonna survive because these guys are gonna kill me. From Wondery, this is Locked Up Abroad. I'm your host, Jim Clemente. In today's episode, Highway to Hell, Thomas Hamill was a truck driver in Mississippi in 2003. At 43, he felt that his life lacked adventure. The war had just begun, and Thomas learned that the U.S. military was looking for civilian drivers in Iraq. He decided that he needed to give something back to his country, and that this was an opportunity he was not going to miss. He kissed his wife and children goodbye, and set off for Camp Anaconda in central Iraq. On April 9, 2004, the one-year anniversary of the fall of Baghdad, insurgents kidnapped Thomas, holding him hostage, leaving him wondering what his ultimate fate would be. Well, I've been a truck driver for 33 years. I don't like just getting up and driving to the factory downtown, working eight or 10 hours, driving back home every day. That's not for me. If I'd have been a good explorer years ago, I want to see something new. Excitement. The U.S. military is looking for truck drivers in Iraq. And one day when I found out that they needed truck drivers in Iraq, it's just like the light bulb went off. I told my wife, this is what I want to do. She didn't really understand. Why you? You know, you're 43 years old. There's somebody else that can go. It might not have been the best thing for my family, but it's something that I needed to do for me at that time in my life. I needed to give something back to my country. You know, I was 43 years old, and this was an opportunity that I was not going to miss. We were based out of the Camp Anaconda, just north of uh, Baghdad. As a convoy commander, I was in charge of the civilian truck driver. Come on, now. It's a place of business, isn't it? These truck drivers come from all over the country, but most of them were for, from down in the south. They were truck drivers in the States, but none of us have, have uh, driven a truck in a war zone. Hey, did you get any sleep last night? That ain't your business, is it? <laughs> During the night, insurgents, they would uh, mortar the camp. I had called my wife and told her to send me as many cassette tapes as she could. I would put a cassette tape in the truck player, try to muffle some of the sounds, and by morning, this tape is so hot, it's just about burn up. I was just thankful that none of those mortars landed on my truck, but you can't be uh, guaranteed 100% safe in a war zone. April 9th was the one year anniversary of the fall of Baghdad. The insurgents, they want to take these anniversaries and make something of it, it was gonna be a bad day. I, I just had that feeling. All right, I need you guys focus and do what you do best, which is drive and drive safely. During our safety briefing with our military escorts, we said we've got some extra shooters uh, we can put in your trucks. And we're gonna do what we do best, which is protect you. That had never happened before. All right. All right. But, if the U.S. military needed me that day, I was going to be Johnny on the spot. <laughs> we had 19 trucks, civilian trucks. I think there were five gun trucks plus our shooters that were riding with our guys. They needed uh, more fuel down in the Baghdad area. 45 minutes or maybe an hour, hour and a half ride, depending on the traffic. 
and we're going to get unloaded, and then we're going to be able to come back, and we'll be in Anaconda tonight. I didn't ever let my guard down when I was outside the base driving because I didn't know who was good and who was bad. And I didn't want to find out the hard way who was bad. We turned off the main road that went to Camp Anaconda, headed south. I mean, I was apprehensive. I'm not sure about the guys that were with me, but I'm thinking back in my mind and months before where, you know, a convoy came through here and we had a lot of trucks that were hit with IEDs there. And as I'm going into this area, I knew that this is where these things could happen. These little kids were throwing rocks and, and they were pretty good. But I didn't let that stuff bother me. I didn't worry about things like that. We just kept moving through. So all we had to do was keep moving through. Let's keep the alert up. We're, we're approaching Widowmaker here. We turned right and veered on the Widowmaker. That was an area of, of road that if, if you were going to die, that was where it was going to die. Any time, any place, an Iraqi could just jump up on the side of the road and start firing at you and drop back down. We would be choked up with traffic there. An ideal spot for a sniper just to take a pot shot at you. If anything is going to happen, if anything is going to happen, it's going to happen on this stretch of highway right here. Almost immediately, it just opens up everywhere. I was in a kill zone. All right, come on now, this is go, go, go. The bullets were hitting this truck all over. Front side, you're hearing a lot of ping. It like gets bouncing off, hitting 10. But, you know, right now they're not hitting where I'm at. And that's, that's a good thing. I grabbed the computer. I was just gonna type a short, sweet message. Convoy under attack now, almost immediately. Slam! The truck rocks up to the one side and, and, and kind of slams back down. And I reach down, and, and all I'm feeling is just warm blood. And I'm thinking, if it's severed the main vein in my arm, I'm going to bleed out before I get anywhere. I knew I had to try to apply some kind of turning back. Come on. Come on. Come on now. Luckily, I've only been shot once. That's what's going through my mind. You know, you know, as long as I don't get hit in the torso, hopefully I can survive this. But the truck was actually slowing down to just a, uh, not much more than a crawler. It's not looking good. Because I, I don't know how much farther we're going to have to go in this. And we didn't roll just a few more feet, and it came to a stop. What are we going to do? And I'm sitting here thinking, this is just a matter of seconds. You know, are we the last vehicle in this convoy? Is there anybody else left to come pick us up? And you're sitting there thinking, is that guy pointing at me out there? Is he got that pointed right at me? He's he pinpointing me with that thing. And, and the next round that comes is coming right at me. I mean, uh, odds are against you here. Out of nowhere, here comes the Humvee. My driver is just out. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, we're out of here. Just as I'm there, the Humvee starts away. And I hollered real loud, you know, whoa. But I knew they couldn't hear me. And 
At this point, I'm thinking I'm not going to survive this. No, no possible way I'm going to survive this. Stop! Stop! And, and it's, it's a pretty sinking feeling. A couple of Iraqis came out. They're hollering. I can't hear what they're saying. I just hear them hollering. And as I turn back, there's one Iraqi insurgent. Guys, AK pointed at me. And I'm thinking, what's, what's, what's he thinking? What's going through his mind? Is he, is he thinking I'm armed? And I'm thinking, man, if he opens up now uh, that close, it's just going to be over. But it's going to be quick, and, and that's the way I want it. These two young boys, they all started toward me. They're going through my pants. They're pulling my flak vest off. They've got my helmet. I, I didn't say a word. I didn't say nothing. I'm just going with the flow. They got me up, started across the road, and, and I looked down this alley, and it's just a, a whole stream of, of insurgents there. I'm thinking, this is, this is not good. Uh, I'm, I'm not trained for this. I'm wounded. I could tell the shouting and the hollering at the head, they, they had a big prize. And I'm thinking, this is, this is chaos. And if one of them walks up to him and sticks me with a knife, that might not be what their commander or leader wants them to do, but it's already too late. And this one insurgent, he's got his rifle. And as I got to him, he started around and swung it. And he caught me on the right side of my head. And the, the guys that were holding me, the insurgents that were holding me, kept me from going to the ground. And I'm thinking, this is a done deal. I'm, I'm a dead man. But all of a sudden, these guys just walked up to me. It, it kind of felt like they stole me away from the guys that just had me. This car just, just pulls them out. But I really wasn't sure with the guys in the car were better for me or if I'd have been better stay with the guys in the alley. See, I didn't know. I guess he was trying to show me off. You know, I've got an American hostage in the, in the back seat. I want everybody to know who I am. I'm somebody special, you know. I'm thinking luck got me to this point. It got me alive to this point, but there's no way I'm going to survive what I'm fixing to face right now, because these guys are gonna kill me. You try to think about your family, but they don't know anything that's going on with me right now. I know they're at home and I know they're safe where they're at, and that's all that matters to me right now is they're, they're safe. compound went back to this building I'm you know I'm thinking you know I don't know what's going on I don't know why they've got me here and they had placed up an Iraqi flag behind me it hit me then we're going to do a video I knew they had ways of killing people, but uh, that was the only concern I had was if they did, how were they going to do it? How would I be executed? Who makes him? That's not this question. My name is Thomas Hamill. I am 43 years old. I live in Macon, Mississippi. I work for a civilian contractor in Iraq. God bless. At this point, I'm not sure what they're going to use this for. You know, I'm just thankful I'm alive. Yes, yes, America. I, I don't know what. He was saying it was an Iraqi. Whatever it was, probably wasn't going to be good for me. 
And I'm sitting there thinking, this has got to be a dream. But as much as I wanted to make it a dream, I couldn't make it a dream. This was really happening. And this was my first day in captivity. Want more locked up abroad in your life? Introducing Wondery Plus. Wondery Plus is the only place to get exclusive access to unreleased audio content, including an unaired interview I did with Billy Hayes. He was featured in our first episode, and there's going to be much more. With Wondery Plus, you'll hear stories you can't hear anywhere else. Wondery Plus is also home to behind-the-scenes looks at our show, scripts, and even more. Visit Wondery.com plus to continue to experience Locked Up Abroad and to get your first 30 days free. That's Wondery.com slash P-L-U-S. Don't miss out on all the exclusive content your ears can take. Sign up today. That morning, everything was quiet. I didn't hear dogs barking. I didn't hear birds chirping. It was just complete silence. And I'm wondering, if these guys just left me here, they're not coming back. But I was, I was desperately in need of water. And it had been nearly two days I had no water. Now, I'm not sure how long it takes for a man to die from uh, dehydration. But I'm going to tell you right now, if it's very long, it's going to be a horrible death. And I said a little prayer. I said, Lord, I, I don't want to die like this. I heard a noise in the little alley, and I looked and I saw a head go by. I was standing at the window, and I was above him a little bit. And as he got right where I was at, Hey, you! I said, I need water. Get me some water. He looked up at me, and it scared the daylights out of him. And I'm thinking, okay. I may have done the wrong thing. Uh, who is he going to bring back now? Just before uh, sundown, I heard a car coming. Hey. I, I needed water bad, but I was not going to beg those guys. I wasn't going to ask them for any water. We need anything? They were going to have to offer it. If they offered me water, I would take water. <laughs> that water was, uh, I would have drank water out of a muddy ditch. That, that's how bad it was. I needed water real bad. And I'm actually telling myself, well, I've, I've got one over on my captors. I knew as the days progressed, my arm would progress even worse. It would, I would have a stench, it would, it would start rotting. And I'm wondering, you know, when are they gonna do something? Is there gonna be a point they're gonna realize we've gotta do something or this arm is gonna kill him no matter how much food we feed him or how much water we give him, he's gonna die just from this. My captors came in and, and uh, told me to get up. Get up. I said, surgeon, go to surgeon, operate on your arm. And I'm thinking, they're going to cut my arm off. They walk me inside, and I'm thinking, this is not a very sanitary surgery room here. Do I know anything about this doctor? Do I, do I know if he can perform this kind of surgery? But all that stayed inside of me. They're not seeing that I look like I'm scared to death, but inside, I'm really worried about this. He said, I'm gonna give you a local anesthetic. And it didn't take very long. It, it just a matter of just seconds and that the local anesthetic went to work. I didn't feel anything. He takes the scalpel and he, he cuts through it. I've got a lot of bone fragments. I think he grabs a couple of them and, and pulls them to the side. 
and he wraps it back up. And I'm thinking, well, he didn't cut my arm off today. I can still live with this. I can still live with this. And that's when it hit me, okay. Are they negotiating to sell me? That's why they're taking such good care of me because I'm not gonna do any good if I'm dead. They're not gonna make any money off of me if I'm dead. In the back of my mind for the first week, there's gonna be a Delta Force raid. <laughs> and these guys are fixing to get a tail open like they ain't never seen. It wasn't until after about the first six or seven or eight days that I realized uh, Chuck Norris wasn't coming. <laughs> I had to figure out ways to escape and evade this enemy, and, and, and it, was, it was all up to me. I was watching their routines every day, uh, the changing of the guards, how they how they did everything. Things had gotten pretty uh, routine, monotonous, same thing every day. But then, just after uh, my afternoon meal, one of my captors was sitting there talking to me. He just, he gets up and uh, I noticed that he had left his AK behind. I sat there and looked at that AK. I could have made three steps and had it. I could have swung that door open and I could have uh, unloaded. But is this a trick? Are they trying to see how I will react? if they leave a weapon behind? Are they trying to figure out if I'm a soldier or not? What if there's not any ammunition in it? What if I swing that door open and they've got a couple of loading guns pointing back at me? My mind cannot be focused on my wife, what she's doing right now, What's my daughter doing? What's my son doing? Because if I have to think for all that first, I'm gonna make a wrong decision because I'm gonna make it hastily. He gave me probably 30 seconds to figure out what I was gonna do. And all I saw was the door come open and his fingers got a hold of that gun and pulled him through the door. And I'm thinking, well, I probably did the right thing this time. Later that night, we went for a, a pretty long ride. I'm looking as much as I could in all directions and it appeared to me we, we were way out in the desert. And it's going through my mind, okay now, why, why are they moving me? And I hear them leave and they uh, drive off and, and I realize I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. I knew my captors would be back in just a little while, but I've got some options now. I've got to figure out what I need to do right now. I'm frantically working, trying to get this door open but there was no way I was going to open that door. No way. Uh, I hear the sound of helicopters outside. I'm thinking, man, I've got to figure out some way to try to flag these helicopters. So if I can shine this little stainless steel plate, all I need is just a glare, one glare up in that pilot's eyes. Hey! Hey! I, I'm not able to pull myself up where I can even see if, if I'm even catching any sunlight. I can't even see the helicopter at this point. All I'm is just guesswork. And it, it flies by, and I'm thinking, well, you know, at least I attempted, I tried. You have to be ready for the next opportunity. The next day, I woke up, and, and I'm, I'm hearing helicopters off in the distance again. And I looked up and saw a piece of, just a piece of wood hanging down from the rafter. And I, I reached up and got a hold of it with my left arm and I pulled down as hard as I could. 
I, I grabbed that timber and I shoved it through that hole. And I'm trying to rock this timber back and forth. I'm doing this double time, everything. I'm, I'm giving everything I've got. Trying to get out, because these helicopters I'm hearing, they're moving. I've got to get out of here. And I gave it a big shove, pushed to one side, and the door pushed open. And I ran out. Two big Chinooks were, were headed in my direction, and a big smile came on my face. I'm going home today. I knew I needed to get up on top of this pile of dirt because it's, it's flat on top. It's tall enough up that these helicopters, they're going to see me above this building. I'm above the building. I just ran out of this pile of dirt. Help! I'm waving frantically and I'm thinking, Help me over here! I'm going to hear that engine dropping down and he's going to drop down here on the ground and I'm going to run over there and they're going to load me up and I'm going to be home with my family before the end of the week. Right here! Oh! I watched the first helicopter go by. Ah! I watched the second helicopter go by. And I'm thinking, just a small country boy from Mississippi in the middle of Iraq, what do I do now? I sit down for a second and I think about it. There was no way that I could walk out across this desert as vast and expanse as it was. There was no way that was going to happen. And I looked at the big pile of dirt I was on, and I'm thinking, the helicopters have been coming from the west to the east. So they're going to be looking right at this pile of dirt. This pile of dirt's probably tall enough and it's steep enough that uh, I can write something in it. After I'd made the H and the E and the L, I was getting tired. I was exhausted. And as I backed away, I'm looking at the H and the E and the L, and I can't even tell it's there. This is not going to work. What else can I do? What else can I do? I'm thinking, okay, I got to ask somebody what I need to do. And uh, I said, okay, Lord, <laughs> I'm, I'm meeting you halfway here, buddy. <laughs> I'm doing everything I can do. I mean, I, I know you can't do it all. You know, I broke out of this building, and I'm trying to flag helicopters down. You're going to have to tell me what you want me to do. Tell me which way to go, Lord. I was up on top of this pile of dirt, looking down at this building I just broke out of. And I just felt the tug to go back down there, step back inside, and lock myself back in. I thought I was going home today. I thought a helicopter was going to stop and pick me up. But for some reason, today is not the day. That's the way I looked at it. Today was not today. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe next week. Today's not today. About an hour or two later, I, I heard the car coming again. And they say, we, we move. And we pulled in this little compound. And when we start through the gate, the guard looked at me and said, do not look at these people. Do not speak. Danger. Danger. Bad Muslim coming. I'm sitting there looking at them, and all of a sudden the door opened up, and this Iraqi, he walks in. Guys, somebody, somebody important, what's, what's going on? All of a sudden, my guards that had came with me, they all walked out the door. And I'm thinking that for a second, okay. If they have sold or traded me up to a, a tougher group. This guy, he just looked over at me and stared at me, didn't come over and say anything, and he walked back in another room. What's what's fixing to unfold right now? 
Stand up. The guys that had me before, uh, they didn't have that look about them. They didn't have that stare that stared right through you. And he, he starts towards me and he brings the pistol down to my forehead. And I'm thinking, it's fixing to be over. I lowered my head, closed my eyes, saying a little silent prayer. And I'm just waiting, just seconds from now, it's gonna pull that trigger. And it's all gonna be over. And I'm trying to think about everything in the future at that point. You know, my daughter's gonna get married one day. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be there to walk her down the aisle, all these things. Seconds have gone by. More seconds have gone by. He hadn't pulled the trigger yet. What just happened? What just happened? And I, I'm not stupid. I, I'm, I'm not ignorant. I knew what they were trying to do. You know, they, they weren't in there to execute me. They were in there to try to scare the daylights out of me try to terrorize me. And I'm, I'm thinking that uh, all the indicators that I'm looking at right now, things aren't, uh, things aren't looking too good. It's, it's really looking bad. As the days went along, they uh, moved me around from place to place. And then finally, uh, we went for a, a pretty long ride. And when we get inside, they undo the blindfold and I'm looking around, and this is a new set of guards. Come on. And I'm thinking, okay, what's gonna happen next? It was just good to be able to get clean for a change. I could feel that dirt and all that stuff just being washed away and just being washed down that drain. I could feel that. How is this small egg? You hungry? He says, I can bring you some eggs. Eggs. He had no gun, he was real soft-spoken, and I just kind of dubbed him the nice guy. Yeah. I've just got a feeling that I'm, I'm safer here with him, and I'm thinking, man, this is where I hope they leave me. He says, uh, do you want to write a letter to your family? I wrote a couple of little paragraphs. Kelly, I'm okay. Hope you're not worried about me too much. Hope the kids and the family's okay. And, I hope to be home one day. Don't worry. Islam, say you will not be killed. So if I can stay with this guy long enough, we can kind of do this rapport thing, and I think I can get this guy to load me up and carry me and drop me off outside of an American base. This is what I'm thinking with this guy here. Later that night, the nice guy walks back in, and Something was not good. I could see it in his eyes. He looks at me and he said, I didn't know they were going to do this. And I'm thinking, what, what? They're not going to do what? You know, you just told me that, according to Islam, they're not going to kill me. What changed that in the last few hours? What's going on now? Something bad was fixing to happen. One of the guards looked at me and said, We hear, we see our people being abused, Abu Ghraib prison. 
what do you have to say? They have it. And I'm telling them, that's not happening. We've, we've had our own soldiers just tortured beyond belief and still in the camps. That can't be happening. Okay. It, it's happening. We see it. It happened. It's happening. It's happening. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, uh, what are they going to do? Are they going to take this out on me? I'm their prison. I'm on the other side. What are they going to do to me? Are they going to torture me now? Are they going to beat me every day? What's, what's going to happen? What am I going to have to endure? I was going to have to learn to live the way they wanted me to live. If I was going to live at all. But I'm not begging anybody for nothing. I'm going to die. And when I do die, whenever they do decide to kill me, if it's right now or later, these guys will have respect in Tommy Hamill when they do. They'd come in after they fed me and they'd put these shackles back on. I'm having to endure this during the night. Maybe eight, nine, ten hours every night. I can't do anything. I can't take these things off. They're not taking them off. I was really frustrated. And I was about to lose control. About to lose control. But uh, one day my captors came in and, and uh, told me to get up. We move again. All right, now what's going on now? What's going on? They walk me up to this little building. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, okay, now where, where are they going with this? They're passing this AK back and forth and they're talking over there. You know, you take it, I don't want it. You take it, I don't want it. And I'm thinking, man, that, that don't look good. What's, what's going on there? Is this some kind of initiation they put their young insurgents through? Well, the little short guy winds up with the AK. He said, get up, we walk. Something has happened. The guard behind me, he's got the AK pointing at my back. I'm thinking, they fed you your last meal, they walked you out, they're gonna shoot you, they're gonna leave you here, they're gonna get in their car and they're gonna leave. The only chance I've got is to take off running. If I just take off running, a moving target, he can't hit a moving target. So I'm thinking, I've got to do something now. I have got to just take off running. If he shoots me, he's gonna shoot me running from him. And I'm thinking at the same time, back up, calm down. Let's wait and see what else is fixing to happen. He told me to stop. Sit down. Sit down. It appears that I'm fixing to be executed. I had been trying to prepare myself for this very moment. What will I do if it ever comes down to execution? Will I beg? Will I plead? Or will I do the honorable thing? So I didn't beg the guy. I didn't say, hey, don't kill me. I didn't say a word. But I'm okay if I die here because if I die here, that's what's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to die here. It's my time to die. All of a sudden, he comes over. Let's get up, mister. Let's go back to the house. I don't know what just happened. Is this some, some more mental, mental torture? You know, I didn't know what they were trying to do. Maybe they just lose his nerve. I, I don't know. 
And then I'm thinking, no, can I take any more of this? How much more of this wondering, are they going to execute me or are they not? Are they or are they not? I can't take any more of this. I've, I've, got, to, I've got to know what's going on. They push me inside this little hut. There's no door. They can't lock me in there and get in their little car and drive off and come back later. They've got to have somebody stand guard right here at this door because I can just walk out of it. And I, I get over in a corner and I, I sit down. It's, it's pitch black. And all of a sudden I hear I'm dragging a piece of metal frame. And I hear them lean it up against the outside of this wall. I'm thinking, okay, they're just going to barricade me in here. And dealing with the chains on my legs for the past five or six days, I hadn't been getting very much sleep at night. So I laid down just for a little while. Me and I, I fell asleep. I just woke up like uh, somebody reached down and, and shook me. I had that feeling. I mean, somebody just shook me and said, hey, you got to get up now. And I'm starting to hear something in the background, some noise. That's a convoy. That's a military convoy going by this building. I get up and I walk over to the door and I push on it. It moves a couple of inches and my eye catches a column of U.S. trucks moving. And I'm thinking, there is no way, no way that they can drive off and leave me today. But there's a guard out here. He's going to shoot me when I slide this door open. He's going to shoot me, I know that. But today, I'm taking that leap of faith. All I've got to do is get to those soldiers, and I'm going home to Kelly today. I just pushed on it, and it just threw to one side. And as it did, you know, I'm out the door, and I never turned around, never looked back to see if that guard was anywhere around. And I'm running, I'm running hard as I can. Right here! And I'm, I'm stumbling, and these, these sandals aren't helping me. And I'm thinking, okay, what are, what, what are the rules of engagement today? I've got to let these guys out here know that I'm not a suicide bomber running across this field, running up this convo and going to detonate a suicide bomb. No! My greatest danger may be in front of me. Stop! Stop! Put your hands in the air! Put your hands where I can see them! And I start hollering, I'm an American. And I'm still thinking those engines are running. I'm an American! Be a dummy! All they're going to be seeing is my lips moving. They're not going to hear anything I'm saying. I've got to let them know as fast as I can that I'm not a suicide bomber. Get out of the ground! Get out of the ground! Now! Put your hands where we can see them! Put your hands where we can see them! I'm an American! No, I'm an American, P.H.I. I'm an American! I'm pulling my shirt off. And I'm saying, my name's Tommy Hamill. I'm the contractor that was captured. Go ahead, Tommy. It's Tommy Hamill. Hey, guys, come Tommy down. It's Tommy Hamill. Hamill. Man, I was about as high as I could get. Don't worry about this wound. I'm going home. They can take care of it when I get home. Just get me out of here. Get me somewhere where I can call my wife and let her know that I'm safe and I'm coming home. I had escaped and I had survived 24 days in captivity in the desert in Iraq. I'm going home to my family today. Forty-three years old, I was uh, looking for some excitement in my life. Uh, I'm not telling everybody to uh, watch what you wish for. You might get more than you planned. <laughs>
Thank you for listening to Locked Up Abroad. You don't want to miss a single episode. So subscribe today on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, the Wondery app on Android, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You'll find a link to subscribe on the episode notes. Simply tap or swipe over the cover art. You'll also see some great offers from our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting our sponsors. If you have a moment, I'd love for you to complete a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. Give us your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts, and be sure to tell all your friends about our show. Locked Up Abroad was produced by Raw TV Limited for National Geographic Channels. For our audio adaptation, the editor is Sergio Enriquez. Our producer is Donna Himes. Our executive producers are Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.